Anyway, thank you so much for coming. And um, uh, I just want to introduce myself too. My name is Celine Nielsen, and um, I work at Drake University. Um, and I've worked with Im immigrants and um, international people uh, for most of my life. I'm an immigrant myself. And, um, but my work with refugees actually started um, not until um, I met Judy and become involved with Iowa International Center. Uh, I didn't even realize, I hadn't realized realized uh, then that um, there were so many uh, there were so many um, resettled refugees in the Iowa area and um, and we did some work and and I learned a lot so last year when I took um, a position in a Turkish University in southeast Turkey in Gaziantep which is um, literally on the Syrian border uh, there were there were a lot of refugees coming it was 2012 2013 there were a lot of refugees coming from uh, the conflict that was going on there, and um, that that actually piqued my interest, and and I wanted to be involved, and I wanted to be able to do something. So I inquired about it. I wanted to um, go into the camps and see what's going on, what what is the situation. But there was some controversy going on at the time. Uh, the camps were uh, pretty much closed. Nobody was allowed in the camps. They were like almost maximum security prisons. Nobody was allowed in or out. Even congressmen or senators, they just uh, couldn't get in. They were refused from the um, entrance points. And um, and you had to get uh, permits from the governors or the, the prime minister's office uh, months in advance so that they would know you're coming. And mostly um, journalists or, or people like that uh, were allowed and, and uh, under supervision. And so that was, um, that made me go in more, <laughs> want to go in more. So I was very interested and I, I asked my university, I said, you know, can I go in and, and see what's going on? And then they said, um, no, absolutely not. They will never allow a person from a university because you do research, you know, you're just going to look and observe and they don't want that. And um, which was from a situation actually um, of the position of Turkey uh, at the time uh, with the going on with the conflict. The, the, uh, and um, anyway, I found a way, which I'm not going to reveal you how, but uh, to get into the camps. And uh, I, I, um, I got a way to observe. I, I found the people uh, that, were, um, uh, that were directing the, the education, because my area is education. That, that's what I was interested in. Uh, and um, uh, going, what's going on in education in the camps, and how are they educating the young, and and, um, and uh, what, what is being taught and, and uh, who is involved, those kind of things. So um, uh, I managed to go in, I observed, uh, we did some projects, um, and um, one of the things that, um, that actually uh, occurred to me over there was uh, I realized that how much trauma this, these children have been subjected to. And, uh, and how I came up to come up with the project of uh, uh, training the teachers with the trauma was that I had um, attended to a dialogue series uh, which um, Mark Gray from University of Northern Iowa uh, was giving about trauma education of refugees. So it was in Iowa, Des Moines at a lunchtime uh, dialogue series that I just got the idea of doing something uh, with the um, uh, children that went through trauma in the education uh, in the camps in Southeast Turkey. Uh, I just wanted to give you, um, I want to start quickly, but um, I want to give you a little bit of a background of Syria and a little bit of history of Syria because it's relevant. Um, what, whatever, um, it's always good to look at history and, and how the events in the past shaped what's happening today. And you will see uh, as, as I go along explaining you um, uh, how the historical events have um, actually contributed to what's happening today. So um, I will start with uh, the place of Syria. It's in uh, the Middle East, south, uh, south of Turkey, and um, west of Iraq. And um, it's a very old part of the world. And as a matter of fact, there has been many civilizations. They found artifacts uh, dating back from uh, remains of um, uh, 
that are dating back to 800,000 years, um, Paleolithic um, uh, remains they found recently in the area. So there are many civilizations that went through there. There were the Hittites, and the, um, uh, there were the Egyptians, and Assyrians, and uh, in 500 um, BC, Persians came. So um, it was a very diverse area from the beginning. And uh, in second century, it was actually important, it was an important Roman province. And um, in 634, it was, um, it was conquered by the, um, uh, by the Muslim Arabs, which was um, an Umayyad dynasty. And um, so, um, so Arabs arrived there, and, and um, uh, predominantly the, the, the religious beliefs started taking shape, changes that started taking shape. About 900, there was another Arab dynasty. Uh, the uh, Abbasids were um, ruled Syria from Egypt. And then, um, and then about 11th century, Turks arrived. Uh, it was first the Seljuk Empire and then the Ottoman Empire. In 1500s, uh, 1516, uh, uh, Sultan Selim conquered the area and, um, and included it into uh, Ottoman Empire, which it's remained for the rest of the uh, 400 years there. So um, uh, what happened was, um, in the Ottoman times, uh, there was some, um, there wasn't, they divided the area with like um, provinces or sort of like states. And um, it was, they were very permissive of religion and culture and language as long as they paid the taxes to the empire. And the local governance um, uh, was left to the, uh, to the people that had their, um, uh, their governance before. So um, uh, except in military or foreign affairs that was um, done through the, uh, through the empire. So um, it was relatively a peaceful period, but um, when the uh, nationalization came about in the world and uh, the, the Syrians wanted their independence, uh, there was uh, about World War I, the, the French and the British arrived in the area because that was the uh, part of the colonization and they were, uh, they were expanding to these areas. So there was, um, uh, there was a, in World War I, uh, there was an agreement between the, uh, a French diplomat and a British diplomat to, to divide Syria into, into different parts, and uh, which was the um, Francois Picot, a French diplomat, and uh, Mark Sykes of a British diplomat, and they, they had this agreement to, to divide Syria in, in different um, uh, parts according to um, the plan of uh, which uh, country will have the influence in which part. So um, uh, after that, about 1920, it was the League of Nations gave the control of Syria to, to the French. Uh, what was happening then was the Syrians, about First World War, they wanted their independence, and when the Western forces were arriving, they actually asked their help to, um, to, uh, uh, to get rid of the Ottomans. But what happened was, yeah, they did get rid of the Ottomans, but now they were, the French didn't leave. You know, they, they just got control. So it lasted until about um, 1946. And so in 1946, the, uh, the French got their independence, and um, but um, uh, it wasn't without some controversy. What happened was, it, when it was under the French rule, like, um, let me just, when it was under the um, French rule, it was divided between Aleppo and Damascus, and um, for, uh, the French divided the, uh, the minorities, uh, the Alawite states. For example, there's uh, Syria is mostly Sunni Muslims. The Muslims have different sects too, like denominations, and the Alawites and the Sunnis. The Sunnis are the majority, Alawites are the minority, about maybe 12%. And, um, and the beliefs are more or less a little bit different, some of the, uh, but it's not, it's not that much different. But what was happening was there were ethnic differences, and um, uh, the Sunni Muslims were against the French rule. So um, uh, the French uh, uh, pitted the Alawite against the Sunnis. They, they encouraged the Alawites to join the, the army and the military. So um, this actually plays importance later on. So what happened 
mentioned was that, um, let's see. This is Syria today. So it's um, in in about 1948 there was an Arab-Israeli war. There were there was always um, tensions between the Israeli and the Syria uh, sided with the Arabs. And in 1956 the Soviets got a foothold on Syria and they sent military equipment and um, to Syria, which made Turkey very nervous because there is this area um, right up here, which is Hatay. It was it was disputed for many many years um, of where they where it belonged to Syria or to Turkey so um, and then in 1963 there was a military coup that happened and the Syria aligned with the Soviets so some of those things probably bring of what's happening um, today with Syria and what happened last year so in 1967 Israel destroyed Syria's um, air force and captured Golan Heights which is still in dispute today and it was a six-day war and um, and then in in 1970, there was another military coup, and Hafez al-Assad, which is Bashar Assad's father, took power. And uh, he was a defense minister in the military, and he was an Alawite. So, um, so you can see, you know, how the um, uh, the power uh, was took shape from the French on. And in 1973, uh, Syria was defined as a secular socialist state, uh, and with Islam as the majority religion. It wasn't an Islamic state. And um, so when Iraq invaded Kuwait, Syria sided with the US-led forces. But in 2000, uh, Hafez Assad died, and, um, and it was another son that was going to take power, but Bashar Assad took power. He was, an, he was actually being trained as an ophthalmologist in England, and he was called to, um, to, gain, uh, to get the power and uh, to rule the country. So, uh, and in 2002, um, uh, Syria was in Included in the axis of evil by President Bush because um, of um, its alleged connections with Hamas, Hezbollah, and, and the jihadists. So um, that that didn't sit well with Syria um, <laughs> so well. So um, what about 2008 and 2008 um, Syria and uh, Isra Israel decided to have a peace treaty and they wanted Turkey as a mediator and um, you'll see how ironic all these things are becoming and then um, uh, but at that time you know Syrian President uh, Assad and, and Turkish Prime Minister today Erdogan were in very good terms and they were getting along fine and um, so what happened since then. There, there's a civil war now. And how it came about is really, really tragic because it wasn't the, the, the sectarian violence or, or anything like that. It started out because between 2008 and 2011, there was a severe drought going on in Syria. And there was economically, uh, the, the country was really in dire straits. And um, what happened was um, uh, Arab Spring came out, came about, and then um, uh, there, it was a movement for democracy and human rights, and um, Syrians went to the streets to protest their government that failed to help them. But what happened was Bashar Assad, you know, getting his father as an example, um, he just wanted to. Um, he just wanted to. Uh, have a crackdown and ordered um, uh, violently to destroy the protesters. And this time riots broke out all over Syria. And it became an international phenomenon. And in about 2011, June 2011, the Free Syrian Army was f formed uh, to destroy Assad and bring him down. And the Free Syrian Army actually was loosely organized independent units. So it wasn't just um, one Islamist group or or Kurds or jihadists or anything. It was just everybody uh, having the same um, purpose of uh, getting rid of Assad. So I'm just, you know, this is just kind of like an overview of the history. What I'm going to also talk about is um, what's going on with the Syrians, Syrian uh, refugees in Turkey and, and you know, what's, what exactly is um, uh, happening now. And, and this is all a pre cursor to that. Well, the Turkish position is, what happened was, when the situation broke and then the Syrians started flooding out of um, uh, Syria uh, as refugees, 
uh, Turkey started taking them in. Um, and, um, but at that time, Turkey had this strange political um, uh, way of that um, they wouldn't involve United Nations. So United Nations uh, did not get involved with the Syrian refugees in Turkey. Turkey took the refugees as guests. So uh, they, to, to the, till today, they don't have refugee status in Turkey. So they cannot be resettled. They, they don't have the rights of refugees, but they are, um, they are protected by the Turkish government. The Turkish government did this for a specific purpose which they denied um, vehemently before but but it came out uh, also you know I I um, observed it was that um, they were helping the Free Syrian army with arms and and um, uh, against Assad uh, but they didn't want it to come out but um, what happened was if they let the Syrian refugees under the um, UN the UN would set up the camps and UN would control the the Syrian refugees and they would not be any military or, or arms or anything kind of involvement. But Turkey wanted to uh, have a control, actually the Turkish government, I should say, uh, wanted to have control over those. So uh, what they did was they wanted to know everything what's happening, They want, and, and, and they um, decided what was happening in the camps. So what was happening in the camps were that people were going and fighting and coming back to the camps, which is not a refugee camp uh, was supposed to set up as. Um, I mean, I have personally observed um, uh, um, the, the cars coming in um, from Syria, ambulances coming in from Syria, bringing wounded soldiers and then leaving with, with arms in the ambulances going back to Syria. So um, those kinds of things were happening and they wanted, to, um, they wanted to control this situation because it was believed that the Syria um, Assad was going to um, go away in a few months and then, and then there would be a new government and Islamic State of, of the free Syrians would form. But four years to today, um, it's not happened. So um, there was a lot of differences. So there are about quite um, a million refugees in Turkey from Syria. Uh, the numbers say it's between 600,000 and 800,000, but it's well over that because there are a lot of people that are also not uh, registered. And this is the border, and then all those red dots are, denote uh, the camps, the refugee camps in Turkey. And Gaziantep is, as you can, I don't know if you can see it over there. Now, uh, but um, let me see. It's, it's right up there. there. There are four camps in, in Gaziantep right now. When I was there, there were two, and then they were building the other two. So, um, Afad is a... Um, uh, is an organization, it's like co comparable to FEMA uh, in America, that, uh, uh, that handles the refugee situation. And they're directly connected to the prime ministry. So the prime minister decides Afad does. So that's, that's what they do. And when I talked to the Afad director, they said that they spend about $1.5 billion on the refugees uh, up until about next year. So it was about two years uh, that, um, that they spend that much money on the refugees, which is doubled now. And um, so um, this was, um, there are some types of accommodations uh, in the camps that I observed. There are camps that are tents, uh, tent camps, and then the, the tents come from Afat sources and then they, they, they have old um, UNHCR camps and everything like that. And, and they have these containers that they recently built. And they built the container camps and they're just, um, and I asked them what, what happens with the con container camps and then they said that they build all these camps and then when the, the situation is over, they're going to use them uh, for emergency situations if there's an earthquake or, or some sort of disaster that they, they, they will be ready in place. So, um, and there are some, um, and the camps all have schools. They have schools, but for example, I went to a camp that was, um, Nizip camp was 8,000 people, a tent camp, and they were, um, the school was for about 300 students. Um, well, if you can imagine, 8,000 people, half of them are pretty much children, and um, for a school for 300 students is just not really much. But um, uh, 
but they were just doing all they can. And how they structured schools were that, this way. The preschools, uh, the children below the age of four, were, um, had Turkish teachers that were uh, hired from the Ministry of Education in Turkey. And, um, but the schools above that, you know, primary schools and middle school, high school level students, uh, they were taught by volunteers from the camps because they were taught in Arabic. And they, um, because Turkey and Syria, uh, they, they, um, they don't share a language. Uh, in Turkey, they speak Turkish, which is a completely different language than Arabic. It's not even close. So um, there's a huge language divide between them. And um, so that was, that, was a, that was a big deal. You know, the children had to be taught in, in Arabic, and then they couldn't find any Arabic speakers in Turkey, let alone teachers. So um, they, uh, they had to um, rely on the, uh, the volunteers from the camps. So the volunteers from the camps, they ranged from um, just people who worked as teachers in their own countries or worked in various different jobs. They just wanted to, um, they just wanted to teach children. And um, of course, resources were, were a problem. Um, the, the preschools were better organized, I would say. Um, but um, there were a lot of cultural and the language differences also made it difficult for the Turkish teachers to um, uh, to be able to reach to the students. And all of these ones, what, what we noticed were that um, uh, the children were going through a lot of trauma and the children uh, were confused and, and there was, uh, the teachers were not trained. There was, um, it was very loosely organized and, and there wasn't much um, being done about um, what's going to happen with the education of these children. It was temporary because it was taught to be lasting maybe Maybe, you know a few months but now it's in it's in its fourth year and there are refugee camps that are known in the world to have lasted lifetimes you know in Thailand there are refugee camps people are born in refugee camps died in refugee camps so um, but um, uh, so people didn't know there was a lot of uncertainty that was happening um, so that was one of the problems that was happening in the in the camps and um, for, for example, I mean, uh, I know this is a, a big picture, but this is like to project it, you know, qualified teachers, they expect like 8,000 teachers, there's now this much, you know, like 154, and, and um, they expect to, um, to educate 432,000 students, right now they're, they're able to educate about 30,000. So education is a very, very big deal, and there are also some work Stories from the uh, refugees. Uh, some of the uh, some of the refugee camps. We uh, we went. Uh, I went with the directors. They went from tent to tent to to see if there are any preschool children that could be coming to the preschools. Because in the preschools, not only you know they provided some education or playtime or anything like that, but they um, vaccinated them and and uh, protected them. But what happened was that um, there was this room and um, uh, that, um, that they're sterilizing our children, they're just going to kill our children type of belief. So they weren't sending their children, small children, to the, to the preschools. So there are these kinds of uh, problems that um, um, between the, the Turkish people and the, um, and the Syrians uh, that came about from lack of communication mostly or little differences or frustrations and, and there's, there's a lot of these things going on. One of the biggest um, problems I asked some of the directors of the um, schools were that they said um, finding qualified interpreters. They, they just could use anyone. They would use anybody who could speak Turkish and, and, and uh, Arabic and sometimes it was very difficult and sometimes they would find really shady interpreters. They wouldn't know, I mean, if it's right or wrong or, or, or if they had ulterior motives or anything like that, but they had to use them. So um, um, that's that's what was going on, and in one of the camps, this was a Slahia camp that I took these pictures. Uh, that um, there was an interesting situation going on. There are 
minorities in Syria too, and uh, there are Turkish minorities in Syria too, which are called Turkmens, like ethnic Turkish people. They speak Turkish. And um, what happened was um, uh, these minorities, I was told, that um, were um, not in a very good situation uh, in overall, overall Syria in that area that they lived, but then when they came to these camps, all of a sudden um, they were valuable because they could speak Turkish and Arabic. That was tremendously important. So they were given jobs. And, and there was even inside the camps, there were some resentments going on because you know they were the ones that could get jobs and they were the ones that were given priority. And, um, and then, um, uh, so there was some kind of situation going on. This camp, Aslahe camp, had a lot of Turkmen uh, people. So, um, so I noticed that um, there was a little bit of that going on. Like uh, they were suspicious of anybody that could speak Turkish and there were a little bit of uh, divisions within the camp. Most of the camps were um, pretty much um, uh, Sunni Arabs, but um, there, are, um, there are some camps being formed. Uh, for example, there is a Christian camp that was going to be formed in Mardin area where there's a Christian population in Turkey, and there were some Alawite camps that were supposed to be formed because Alawites, because Assad was an Alawite and he was hated so much, it was just, um, it was a big, um, uh, it was a big division, and uh, and there was um, a lot of um, violence between the people of the sort. So um, they were, uh, they had a lot of resources actually. They had the school buildings that was from Kilis camp, which um, uh, we visited. It was the biggest camp that I visited. It was 14,000 people. There were probably close to about 18,000 people living there, though. Um, and then and then they had some vocational. Uh, classes, extracurricular activities. Um, they, uh, the, the women and children were taught um, different kind of, you know, uh, arts and crafts. Uh, there weren't a lot of things that were geared towards uh, the education of the grown men because um, in that camp, particularly, that camp was right on the border and the men would go fight and then come back. So they weren't really around much of the camps. And um, so some of the school facilities, in the tent camp there were, for example, six of these tents, big tents, uh, that were used as schools. And the schooling was voluntary. You know, there was no um, uh, getting role or anything like that. People who wanted to come to school, they would come to school. And then uh, if they reached, uh, um, they weren't even, uh, for example, I told you there were about 300 uh, students within a camp of 8,000. There wasn't a lot of interest either. So um, it was, um, because they didn't believe that they would gain anything from going to these schools. They had no, um, uh, one of the things that happened was um, uh, the schools didn't have much of a formal uh, degree or anything like that. Where were they valid? It was, it was a little bit um, questionable. So um, people were confused about, you know, if we go to school and, and we learn what. And um, and the, in the tent camps, there were the bathrooms and the showers were separate. So uh, people who lived in the camps or, or went to school, they had to go to separate um, buildings. And um, and the schools had had certain um, they had boards, and then they were teaching. They were uh, being taught by um, uh, by volunteers. Some of the volunteers included. Um, uh, like former Air Force people. And um, <laughs> there's a story that I want to tell though. Uh, there was one time that we went with the AFAD director, you know, like the, uh, the emergency management director and the mayor of Nizip, that town. Uh, we just went with protocol to this camp. And, and I had bought these two boxes of lollipops. And then because I knew that in the tent camp, they didn't have any chance of getting any sweets or anything because the, the, the food was uh, given to them. And, and so 
I thought it would be a good idea for the kids to have. So um, the mayor just saw the boxes and then he, in the car and then he said, what are those? And then I said, you know, I just was going to give the sweets. And then he said, no, 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 you can't do that. And then I said, why not? And then he said, well, you know, this is what happens. You start giving sweets to a bunch of children and then more will come and more will come and it's just going to be a total chaos and you just can't do that. There was one prince that came from Saudi Arabia, started giving coins and then they just, they just got onto the car, he couldn't even get out of the car. And then I said, okay, we'll just give it to the director, then he can distribute it later. So um, so we got out, and then we were greeting the children. I, I had seen these children before, we had worked before, and um, and I turned around, and what did I see? The, the AFAD director and the mayor were just got out the boxes and then giving candy to the children. What a politician thing to do, huh? <laughs> grounds of the schools and then these are the schools, these are the administration buildings from this camp. I spent a whole lot of time in this camp. Uh, it was very good to um, find out what was going on and what they needed. Uh, and um, there was one time, UN was per, uh, periodically coming and visiting these camps. So there was one time that when we were there with actually one of the professors that came from University of Northern Iowa and um, uh, there was a uh, UN uh, van came and there were a bunch of people in it and then I could see that they were just taking pictures, a lot of pictures, and, and they came in and the director said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I need to talk to them, this is their visit, and uh, they write reports about it, and then I said, okay, that's great. So, um, so we were just watching them, the UN convoy came, they got out, they just were tch -tch 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 -tch, took pictures, they got inside and they left. Six minutes, I counted, six minutes they spent on the camp, and they write their reports. So, I, I don't know, that was one of the things that I, <laughs> and then the, the director said that it's pretty much, you know, usually they do that. And some of the universities, they just send people, I mean, they go through a lot of things that they, they, they finally get access, and then they have all these plans to do these things with the, with the refugees, and then um, they get the um, money, and they get the, uh, they get all the permits and everything, and then what happens is they don't show up and they don't do these things. So um, it's usually uh, all in paper. You read about it, you 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 see it in the media, and then well, well, how much of it is happening? We just don't really know. And this school was actually um, tents were inside a building because of climate, and this was an old um, tobacco factory uh, that actually warehouse that they kept the tobacco and then they, they emptied and then uh, it was um, they, they were they were they set up the tents inside the building uh, to for the schools and um, some of the they, they wrote on the walls and then I asked them what they write on the walls and then they said mostly they write the names of the towns that they come from because they need to feel a sense of identity and um, and these were some of the uh, people we visited um, to, uh, to actually um, try to um, ask them to send their children to the preschools and if they have any preschool children. Uh, we also saw that uh, some other children, like 11, 12 years old, were taking care of um, younger children. And um, this is, again, for the climate, that uh, it gets very hot there, similar climate to Syria, that, um, that they had to provide some shading uh, for the tents. Um, I, this is the camp school. This is one of the biggest camps where Angelina Jolie visited, and, and yeah, they um, uh, they have a building actually for the school. So which which is a this is also Kilis. It's almost like a town. Like I said, there were about eighteen thousand people. There's a mosque. There's some um, uh, little shops that um, that they live there. Uh, how they live their lives is that they are given an allowance every month, and um, uh, and there's uh, they can go and spend it on food, about $40, I think, a month. Uh, and then um, and they have to stay in the camps, but they, they can leave the camps. They're, they're allowed to leave the camps, but um, mostly uh, because they can't work, it's uh, it's not possible for them to find any other kind of resources to um, uh, 
to, to go anywhere and, and do any other kind of activities. And uh, one of the things I want to mention is that, um, actually, let's go in that. This is when we were doing the training uh, with, the, uh, with the teachers, um, the trauma training, and they were just amazed because they just didn't know even um, what they were going through and, uh, and, and how much trauma the kids have been through and, and how to handle the children's trauma because they were assigned, uh, the preschool teachers were assigned uh, their jobs there and, and the volunteers had no idea. And this is another school, a new school uh, in El Beili. The, the thing about it is that uh, this, this uh, new camp was the, uh, had a capacity of 35,000 refugees. And uh, this, this small towns around the camp, uh, there were three little villages around the camp. The total population of the Turkish uh, uh, villages uh, amounted to about 10,000 people. So imagine there were 35,000 capacity, which probably will exceed that um, refugees being brought to an area where uh, the, the locals are 10,000. It really um, starts a lot of um, uh, social problems within the area. And, um, and I'll just mention it briefly too. These were some of the pictures from the camps. And um, uh, some of the some of the challenges for the directors were, um, of course, climate and attendance and and violence between the students. And um, there were some books that were brought from from Turkish ministry, but they were all in Turkish. They couldn't, you know, use them. And there were some other problems uh, with the students that um, that went through a lot of violence. I talked to some students that witnessed their father being killed. There were some students that were, um, uh, that were, uh, their neighbor's house was bombed. There was one woman that I just, I, I can never forget that um, uh, I was talking to the psychologist in Kilis camp, which is 18,000 people. Uh, there's one psychologist, uh, he's Turkish, and it's a male. I mean, how can you help 18,000 people who's going through trauma? Uh, it's, it, it was absurd, but he was trying. Every day he was seeing people through interpreters and everything, and there was this one woman who actually um, witnessed their neighbor's house being bombed, and then uh, she actually was taking care of the neighbor's children, so um, she uh, went out to pick up the pieces of the neighbor's children, and um, so put them together uh, so that um, they could take them to the families. It was just, it was just uh, these kinds of things that they have witnessed. And, um, this was, this was one of the, the children, too. Uh, I talked about the language issues, cultural issues. In Turkey, um, uh, the Turkish prime minister was um, giving a lot of, um, uh, they were, um, because um, he's, he's uh, uh, sided with the Sunni Muslims and he's sided with the Free Syrian Army. Um, he was trying to um, uh, bring these people and, and, and trying to uh, make them uh, feel at home. But w how he was doing that was very alarming because what he did was he gave special um, provisions to the Syrian refugees where Turkish um, nationals or citizens didn't have. See, this is what happens. Um, in Turkey, there's a university entrance exam. 1,200,000 students take it, right? high school students take it every year. About 200,000 students are placed, and 1 million students cannot go to college. That's, and, and every year after the, uh, uh, after the results are announced of this, uh, this exam, there are, there are a lot of um, uh, students that commit suicide. It's just, it's just a disastrous thing. I mean, people, um, people get sick studying for this exam, they lose their hair. I mean, there's a lot of stress involved with getting to this exam. And, um, and it's, it's not even one step thing. Uh, if you go to a, a private school, you have a better chance of uh, scoring higher on this exam. So uh, people try to take an exam to go to a private school. And all the, the and private school you pay, but you still have to take an exam. I do remember being 11 years old and studying for 
for this exam to go to a private school and and getting getting really sick and looking outside the window my friends playing and I just couldn't because I had to study in order to get to this private school and and uh, so that I would have a better chance of scoring high in this university entrance exam so this is the situation in Turkey when the Turkish Prime Minister said well uh, Syrian people that are in Turkey uh, that can go to university they don't need to take an exam this is what happens there people start resenting uh, and uh, for example if you if you have children and you give one a lot of uh, rights and uh, and a lot of chances and you just uh, tell the other one that you can't do anything well what will happen is they will hate each other they won't hate you because they need you but they're gonna start hating each other so this is what's starting to happen in in the society today so um, and people can tell who's who's Syrian and who's not well Syria uh, even though majority is Muslim they're uh, similar to Turkey not everybody is covered or you can't tell uh, that uh, but um, for most of the refugees that come that are the Sunni Muslim they're from the uh, con uh, they're usually conservative uh, a Muslim population that 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 is covered so can you tell from all these pictures which which picture is Syrian and which is Turkish So I will tell you, actually, these are Syrian way of they cover their heads. And it's, um, so, and then these are Turkish. They're from different parts. See, covering head is not religious. It's not only religious, I should say. It's geographical and it's traditional. So this is Northern Turkey, close to Russia. And this is Eastern Turkey. This is Southern Mediterranean coast. It's, um, and then this is a very political symbol that just came about in the 70s in Turkey that just uh, shows who's um, with the party of the uh, religious party. So um, when you're in Turkey and you're Turkish, you can immediately tell who is from Syria. And this one actually is a, a Christian Orthodox nun. I just thought that I would just put it there. <laughs> <laughs> because it looks like one of the, you know, the the uh, other that the, that people were exactly similar. I took, I look at pictures and then I can't tell the difference. Anyway, so so that's why, you know, it's it's um it's geographical, so people can tell. When people can tell, they can discriminate easier, which is you know one of those problems that we come up. And um, and of course, some of the new problems that come out, unemployment. They can't work. Um, I had friends um, uh, that were professionals uh, from Syria and they can't work and they just um, uh, there are um, there are doctors and they're pharmacists they're engineers and and this is some of those things so there's some um, crime and prostitution and the prices are raised uh, because of the uh, people getting their money and coming uh, not only to the camps but to live in Turkey to get away from the violence um, I'll just make a couple more points and then um, this is the Prime Minister of Turkey uh, what his uh, Syrian policy was actually a mistake uh, but he just decided he uh, he decided to um, uh, not take the UN's help and and take care of it on his own uh, with the hopes of uh, helping the Sunni Muslims and then uh, establish a Muslim Brotherhood and then and have a power over in the area but it just didn't work out so well because um, there's also um, um, there's also some uh problems with the jihadis uh, hurting the Kurds in northern Syria because there's the ethnic Kurds and um, uh, what happens is that when when he opens the the doors and then and then um, and gives arms to to all the free Syrians he has no idea who he's helping uh, and what kind of consequences he's um, uh, he's going to end up with so it was a it was a it was a bad policy to um, not to plan it just to do it and to pick the people against each other create resentment towards um, uh, Syrians in Turkey in the population which was which was just a horrible thing to do uh, the Syrians yes they think that he's helping them but in the long run I think it's going to hurt his policies um, all the people that are right now stuck in Turkey 
So um, these are some of my friends. I'll take two more minutes uh, introducing them, and then I'll take questions. Um, this young girl lived in a tent, and she was going to law school in the University of Aleppo when the war broke, and she had to come. And it was no way she could do anything. So she's now living in the camp and trying to survive. Just survival is her only goal. And um, this, I went to visit this family. Uh, this baby was born on the border. They were just telling me that you know he's Turkish. And um, uh, we visited them when we were leaving the tent. Um, uh, the lady just uh, handed, uh, I wanted to hand the baby back to, to the mom. And then the mom said, no, keep it. And um, that was the most heart wrenching moment in my entire life. I'm a mother and it's just, it's not some, it's not something you take lightly. And um, so, um, and these girls uh, witnessed their father being shot. And, um, and these were some of the families that, that we visited. And, um, and this was a family of nine people actually lived in this container camp. And, um, and they were farmers before. They had like two different houses and then their, their farmhouse and, and animals and everything. And then they, they, um, they fled and came. And, um, and this, the girl was just, just magnificent. 16 year old girl, she just learned Turkish in two months and she was just, she is the most inspiring person and optimist per, big person that I've ever met. Um, this is her, her name was Ravdanur. And um, this is inside their uh, container that they welcomed us. They are the most kindest, welcoming people and sincere that we just, um, we, um, we had a really good time visiting. Most people, of course, spend their time playing soccer and um, but when they play soccer, they, they, um, when the ball goes to the other side, they can't, you can't really climb and get it because it's a minefield on the other side. So um, there are some pictures I wanted to share. There's, um, I think, one more point I want to make. This is from the school, salvaged books from uh, uh, Aleppo schools. This was a school in Gaziantep outside of the camps uh, for refugees. These are my friends. She's a pharmacist. He's an anesthesiologist. They just, uh, they were living in, in uh, Gaziantep and, um, and they didn't know what the future held for them. And their children, um, the, the two older girls, they just, um, they couldn't go to school because there, there was no way, there was no school actually that um, they could go to. They didn't speak um, Turkish. The, these two kids went to the um, Arabic school. This was a friend that actually played in the Symphony of Aleppo and he just had, he just escaped and then left his workshop. He was also making these instruments, ouds, but um, he just couldn't do anything. He was just staying with friends and, and family and from place to place and, and um, didn't know what was going to happen to him. And these are some of the teachers we, um, we taught. This, um, this young man, I called him 007, was, um, uh, he looked like James Bond, and he was actually a volunteer teacher at the camps. He was, um, he was showing my son in his uh, cell phone that um, uh, how, how he fought and, and killed people. So he had in his cell phone uh, uh, shootings, and they would go and check and if the people were dead. And he, he had it on his cell phone, and he was showing, and he was volunteering as a teacher. I mean, these things were happening. It was just a fraction of it. This is in Istanbul, and um, this young, beautiful uh, woman uh, had this sign here saying that, I'm Syrian. Uh, Please, for God's sake, help me. I don't speak Turkish. So um, I could only imagine any, you know, of the things that could happen to her in a place like Istanbul is like New York, you know, just in the middle of the city. So anyway, thank you very much for, um, and then I'll just take some questions now. I'm sorry, it took a little bit longer. I have so much to say about it, but um, I just had to um, kind of summarize. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, can you explain what type of government is in Turkey? Well, Turkey is a. Yes. 
situation? Well, Turkey is a secular republic, uh, uh, but the the government, uh, the the party in in control right now is um, is religious. So um, uh, so they they are trying to um, they are trying to change Turkish um, uh, Turkey into a more Islamist uh, type of government, um, and so it's and there's a lot of clashes. There's there's a bunch uh, there's uh, a population that is uh, the secular population is completely resisting this. So that's what's happening. Any other questions? Yes. You brought Mark, Mark Gray to yes. the camps and. Talk about how you helped to set up some disaster relief programs in the camps. Yes, yes. What we did was um, um, we gathered the teachers of these schools and, and people who were influential in the camps, and um, and uh, we gave them seminars in in trauma and how to handle trauma and uh, in in refugee situations. So um, that's uh, and we brought them to the university, and also we went to the camps ourselves uh, to to train them, and um, so that was one of the things that we did in our project. Yeah. Yes. Um, the preschoolers that are being taught in Turkish, are they uh, learning the language and uh, kind of like they're immersed in that Turkish language, or how's that working out for them? Well, the um, yes, I, I, uh, the the question is that um, uh, the preschools have, are, have they been immersed in Turkish? Um, the what happens is that the, the the teachers are Turkish; they don't speak Arabic, so um, uh, the classes are in Turkish, and they're they're teaching them uh, Turkish songs and things like that. The the preschools are not very um, uh, you know they're not very educationally organized um, uh, to teach reading or writing or anything like that uh, but um, but the children do learn <coughs> Turkish and um, and there are also um, Turkish as a second language classes being offered but but the directors told us that we are very careful about those we just we offer the classes but if they're interested they take them we don't force them because there's there, we don't want them to think that we're forcing them to learn Turkish so um, that was one of the things yeah. yes the situation is so complicated that um, that it's not. Um, I don't. I don't know how to solve the problems. It's just that um, uh, I would not contribute on making them worse. <laughs> you know, if I were the prime minister. Yes. Uh, so, what do you think the U.S. should do? Well, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. Well, right now, what the U.S. is doing is just um, uh, initially, I think they were supporting the Free Syrian Army because uh, Assad's forces were really violent. But there's violence in both sides. I, I hate to I hate to say it, but I have seen. Um, uh, the, the results of the violence from both sides. There's just this horrible war going on between people, and um, and it's bloody, and it's just um, so um, because Free, Free Syrian Army is divided, there are jihadists. If the if the U.S. helps Free Syrian Army against the you know like the. Uh, the government that is that is slaughtering them, then are they helping the jihadists that is going to come and bite them in the back later on? Uh, are they helping the Kurds? I mean, they are Kurds uh, allies in in Iraq, or or are they helping the Sunni Muslims and and get the uh, the the uh, the backlash of the Alawites? So um, there are all these questions. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I just I can just. Um, Give you the situation, and maybe you can uh, think of what what could be done. But I wouldn't want to be Obama. <laughs> yes. Is there any move toward um, a more permanent settlement for any of the refugees, or is it just an extended temporary? 
Oh, that, that's just, uh, that just um, the question is that is there a permanent settlement for the refugees? We don't know when this war is going to end, so everything is set up per temporary. But um, what's happening is that um, it's temporary, but it's sustainable. So um, uh, with help, I guess international help, these, these camps could go on as long as, the, as, as it takes. But um, of course, it's a very big strain on people's lives not knowing what's going to happen. Um, and um, I haven't heard of any resettlement or anything that's happening for Syrians now. I called UNHCR myself and they said there is no such thing that's happening right now. Maybe in the future, yes, but I'm not sure right now. Yes. <laughs> Who's paying for all the camps and so forth? Is Turkey putting the bill for the whole thing or is there other in Turkey, yes, the, who is paying for all the camps is the question. Um, uh, in Turkey, the Turkish government is paying it. Uh, like the taxpayers are paying it uh, for, the, for the Turkish camps. And um, they do get, I heard that they do get a little bit of help from United Arab Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia, but, but not much, just um, some of the monetary help. Um, and, um, but you, they don't get any help from UN. They haven't had that uh, agreement yet. So, yes. Well, have there been offers from governments where the, um, the majority of the people are, say, Sunnis or these different groups, have they offered to take some of their, the people that believe like they do in? <laughs> You would think that, right? <laughs> but um, no, uh, the question is that uh, are there some governments that are ethnically aligned with the, with the refugees taking on? Um, for example, um, United Arab Emirates or, or some of those wealthy Arab countries that are also Sunni Muslims, they just said that we'll give some money, but you keep the refugees. <laughs> that's, that's the sentiment, actually, in the area. Uh, they don't want refugees. They, they, they say that we'll give some money, but um, we don't want the refugees on our land. So right now, the Syrian refugees are in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, uh, some are in Iraq, um, which is ironic because Syria used to take refugees from Iraq, and now there are Syrian refugees in Iraq. It's um, uh, and in Lebanon, there are a lot of questions because it's. I mean, there are a lot of problems because it's a very poor nation, and um, the camps are putting a lot of strain. Uh, and uh, socially, I think there are more problems there that they're refugee camps because of social differences and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Question about media coverage. It's yeah. sort of in the news cycle here you'll see it kind of rise and fall. Periodically. Yeah. What about in other parts of the world? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the question is that uh, how is the media covering this situation? Well, it's different, of course. Um, the, in, in Turkey, uh, the media is um, controlled by the government now who, um, who is uh, putting the situation in however they want to put it. But um, in other parts of the world, Al Jazeera and stuff like that, they do, they do report on the situation that is happening now. I mean, if you, if you read Al Monitor, or you know, uh, and, and some of the Arabic uh, media coverage or uh, journalism sites or anything like that. Uh, if if you have accounts of the Twitter, you can see uh, a lot of coverage about the Syrian refugees and what's going on uh, there. And and um, some organizations actually are very active in helping, uh, like Doctors Without Borders and, and Mercy Corps, and, and some organizations that are really um, going. Going in and, and trying to do some uh, humanitarian help in these areas, but um, they're all limited. Yeah. Yes. For a so grateful that you're teaching ESL yes. classes at Zion and Lutheran to yeah. a variety of different refugees. Would you talk about that program and what you're doing here in Des Moines with refugees? Yes. Um, uh, through Iowa International Center, there's a, a, there's a program of teaching English classes to the refugees. And most of the refugees are from Burma and Thailand. And, uh, and there are some African ones. So um, they have no uh, English skills. 
and they have no programs that are teaching them English. Uh, some have jobs and some don't, but um, uh, socially it's very difficult for them to adjust or, or um, um, into the society because um, when you don't speak the language, there are a bunch of problems happen. So um, uh, we are teaching on Sundays and Wednesdays to some of the refugees uh, basic skills and, and some English so that they can um, they can survive in this, in in Des Moines and, and Greater Iowa. Yeah. Are any of the Syrian refugees coming over here? Not yet. Not that I heard of, but it might happen. You know, um, I I think there's there's. Maybe one or two, I think some, somebody said in Des Moines, but, um, but I, I haven't heard a group of refugees arriving in the United States that are resettled. Not from Turkey, at least, yeah. So, thank you very much for listening to me. Yeah.